Um, okay, I want to talk about the HFIT project. Thank, thanks for the introduction. Um, so you got some idea, I guess, of, of what I've been doing here. Uh, I, I've been involved in this program for the last five years now. Um, and uh, it's the job I took after I left, left NCAR. Um, it's called the Hurricane Forecast Improvement Project, um, or HFIP. Um, it actually dates back to a bunch of hurricanes that came on shore. I remember it was like five hurricanes that hit Miami or Florida one year. And there was Katrina and Rita uh, before that. Uh, got the attention of some people in Washington. And apparently there was a uh, something that came out of the administration at that point. I forget who was president. Someone can help me with that. Um, <coughs> to support accelerated improvement of hurricane track and intensity forecasts, which would help prevent unnecessary costly evacuations. Um, and there's some other points here too, like uh, improved forecasts can lead to longer, at longer lead times can, uh, can help with uh, um, reducing overwarning uh, and help with uh, help emergency managers and so forth and how they respond. Um, so this basically says the uh, increased accuracy at longer lead times, especially during periods of rapid intensity change, raise confidence levels at all forecast periods. We actually published a, a bulletin article um, a couple, about a year ago, two years ago. Um, and uh, this was the, the cover for that. Um, I don't know if you know, the, co the cover for bulletin now isn't really, um, necessarily showing uh, great science. It's supposed to be something that looks neat. And so I proposed this and um, they said, oh yeah, that's exactly what we want for the bullet. So so we got the cover the, the time when we uh, did. You know, one could ask, uh, what was this guy doing right? Um, but at any rate, this was um, uh, the area north of Galveston and I'm not good with hurricane names. That was Ike, I believe. Uh, it wiped everything out except for this one house. So the question is, can we uh, forecast that a week ahead of time? Um, I drove down that road about a year ago, and all the buildings are back, pretty much the way they were. <laughs> well, I don't know. It keeps the the guys that do the construction in business, I guess. So. Um, it's a 10-year program. It had two phases, a five-year program, a five-year part and 10-year part. Five-year part is over this year. Um, <clears throat> so there's a second part that's supposed to follow on. It was going to be a program, or it is a program, designed by NOAA, but a big emphasis on non-NOAA collaborators. Um, and I think it goes a little further than non-NOAA collaborators. It basically says people beyond, beyond NSEP involved in the developing of the models. So there's a lot of... Um, people involved in the program from uh, other, other components of NOAA, particularly ESRO, uh, NHC, um, AOML, and so forth. Began in 2009, and forecast was improving weather prediction model guidance. And we have to keep emphasizing that what we're doing is improving guidance, not forecast. Um, NHC makes the forecast. We provide guidance to them from which they make the forecast. There's a, it's an important um, nuance, I guess, if you're in NOAA. Um, <clears throat> so the vision then was to organize the community um, to dramatically improve hurricane forecast guidance in, in these two phases, five years and then 10 years. And these were the main goals. Um, reduce numerical forecast errors in both track and intensity by 50% in 10 years, or 20% uh, in, in five years, 50% in 10 years. Extend the forecast out to seven days and increase the probability of detecting rapid intensification at day one to 90% and 60% at day five. And this is at the end of 10 years. Uh, we've got a long way to go to get the RI right. Um, we are making forecasts at seven days, which is an interesting nuance in that, which I'll show you in a minute, which kind of came out this last year when we actually looked. Louie asked us, well, how are you guys doing on the seven-day forecast? And our response was, we don't know. So we, we had Mike Fiorina look at it, and you'll see what, what we got for that. This is what the, uh, the um, goals look like in 
two kinds of space. Uh, the black lines are what we call air space. So this is um, this is track air, and we uh, established something called a baseline back in 2009, which were the uh, average errors of the numerical guidance NHC was getting at the time from various sources like EMC, e ECMWF, uh, GFS uh, system, and so forth, HWARF, if you like. This was, the, this was kind of an average, and so this was what we were going to try to beat. 20% goal would be the five, or the 20% goal is the five-year goal is this dash line, and then um, the 10-year goal below it. Well, <coughs> when you talk to NHC, you say you've got to be really careful with error because some years are really easy, and this last one, 2013, turned out to be an easy year. Um, what you really need to do is compare it to something they call skill, which is basically the error relative at each point in time, relative to the simplest statistical model that we have. And for track, it's called Clipper, Climate and Persistence uh, Forecast. Clipper is a lousy model. And if you look, um, you know, even at, um, well, Clipper is a, is a lousy model, so the, 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 uh, uh, it's easy to beat it, but still, by doing it this way, you take out your, some of the year-to-year -year var variations that you see um, in, in error. So again, the 10-year skill goal is up here. Uh, hopefully, we get to like 80%, five-year skill goal, and then baseline looks like, like that. And you can do intensity, too, um, and that's what they look like in the two different spaces. One of the problems, uh, one of the arguments that we've been getting into is how good can you really do, say, in intensity? Um, for example, what is the observation error? For one thing, we don't observe intensity. There's not a single observation anywhere that really defines what they mean by intensity. Um, so what can you, you know, how good are we estimating? The estimates are that the best we can do is about 10 knots, and our 10-year goals are all below that. Now, we can argue that if you like, um, and there was some pressure for a while to, to change this because it was an unrealistic goal. But as you see, we're getting, we have potential to get close to it. So the scope is to prove hurricane forecast system. What we're not going to do is uh, put money into acquiring new observing systems, but better use better uh, use the existing data in in our um, in our systems better than we have in the past. And then also to to add forecaster tools um, to help uh, interpret the model guidance that they're getting. Another thing we did was um, add or build up a computer system. It's over in um, Boulder in the Skaggs building. Uh, it's done in phases. Um, we have this alphabet soup of jets. Um, first was NJET. Um, so it was about 3,000 cores. And then we did some horse trading. And uh, we only have about 100 or 500 cores here left because we gave them to somebody else. But that allowed us to get a 10,000 core machine, which we call T-JET and then U-Jet, and then S-Jet. And this year, we added a fourth, a fifth jet called V-Jet, which will bring the total number of cores available up to about 27,000. I don't know what these numbers look like. This was just sort of a comparison of the machine we had in Boulder for hurricane work, or for hurricane forecasting. Uh, the system that we had in Boulder in 2012 um, we had these teraflops. All of this was available for the hurricanes, and we ran it in real time in the summertime, sort of quasi-operationally, so technically all of these were available. Um, <coughs> the ops computing at the time was this. Uh, only about 26% of that went to forecasting, so what we were able to come up with at that time was a machine that was about 10 times more powerful than what was available in operations. Uh, it's not true anymore, because NCEP has moved on. Um, <clears throat> but we have to, but not as fast. The overall strategy then when we started out was to use global models at as high resolution as possible to forecast track out to seven days. Um, hard to beat the, the global models on track. 
Um, we can get close with HWARF, but um, since the, uh, the regional models tend to be a, or are a subset of a global model, it's kind of hard to do better with TRAC um, on, on a, uh, with a regional model that's being uh, driven by a global model. However, you don't have the resolution in the global model, so we run regional models at much higher resolution uh, with the goal of doing better with the intensity forecast. One of the things that um, we showed early in the program that the data simulation system that they were using at NSEP um, wasn't the best choice, I guess the way to put it. Uh, we had uh, several people working on an alternative data simulation system, Jeff Whitaker down at Ezreal, uh, Fuching Zhang, and um, we're quickly showing that a different type of data simulation than what they were using, called GSI, <coughs> and uh, we were using an ensemble data simulation system. And what they decided to do then was to move to what we called a hybrid system, which contains both um, a, three, uh, a GSI, which at the time was and still is a 3D VAR system, and an ensemble system to define the background error. And again, both both of these models be run as ensembles. It's an interesting. <coughs> you get a lot of information out of the ensembles, but we can't seem to convince NHC that there's any value in single model ensembles. Um, they, they fully believe in, in multi-model ensembles because they've been using that for years, but the uh, single model ensembles are still not convinced. And then a statistical post-processing process, and I'll say a little bit about that. <coughs> so we think the five-year performance goals are within reach. <coughs> the new NSEP um, GSI hybrid system went into operations in 2012. Uh, they saw a dramatic <coughs> improvement in track forecasts at that time, uh, <coughs> uh, exceeding the five-year goal, actually. Um, <coughs> a third nest was added to H4 in 2012, allowing intercore resolution of three kilometers and other changes. And you'll see that the H4 has improved dramatically since we started doing that. And it, it gets better every year, not just from the resolution, but from other things. <coughs> One of the things that we um, had to look at early on, there was a lot of indication that we're getting a lot of value from the radar data. This is particularly the tail radar <coughs> on the P3 <coughs> in intensity forecast. Um, there was a careful study done, led largely here at NCAR, the TCMT, on the value of the radar data. Um, and what I say here, I'm not, I decided not to show those slides, but I can pull them up if you really want to see them. Uh, since it was done here, I'm sure people have seen those, those things. But the uh, impact of the radar data on intensity forecast is still debatable. Um, the results were very mixed. Um, if you use all the aircraft data that's collected, and that includes flight level data, um, <coughs> the SMFR data that gives you wind at the surface, uh, drop sounds and the radar, uh, you seem to get a, an improvement out to about 72 hours, which is about what we would expect. <coughs> but again, it's, it's, it's not as dramatic as we originally thought. Again, I won't say anything more about that, but uh, if you're interested, we could go into it. Talk about the global models. Um, I think this kind of sums up where we are with the uh, GFS system. Um, and we're comparing it to the UCMWF system. This is what it looked like uh, 2008 through 2011. That's whatever they were running operationally at the time. Um, neither model did very well initially. ECMWF obviously did better at the longer lead times. GFS actually got worse. Um, but if you look at the later years after we made this change, so here's 2012, 2013, all of a sudden GFS jumps way up and is, is uh, <coughs> And this is track, I'm sorry, this is just for track. Um, <coughs> GFS jumps way up and is, is, is competitive with the ECMWF. Sometimes ECMWF is better and sometimes GFS is better. But what's dramatic here is that <coughs> after day four, this improvement disappears. And it disappears for both models. Um, so the question we've been asking, and this is something we could ask you folks, here, if you have any ideas, 
what happens at day four? One thing you got to be a little careful of, there are different hurricanes out here. These hurricanes that last this long are, of course, contained up in the early set. But the hurricanes that don't last five days um, <clears throat> aren't in this set. So it's, it's a, a different collection of hurricanes out there that may be that these long-lived ones are harder to forecast, maybe something else. But both ECMWF and GFS do the same thing. One thought that somebody had, I think this was Steve Lohr, he said, wow, that's because you have all this lousy data out in the Pacific. And in four days, it all goes uh, vecting into the Atlantic, and therefore your forecast goes to pot. And I said, well, OK. If that's true, we should be able to look at another basin and see if you get a better result. And in particular, the Westpac, everything upstream from the Westpac has got lots of data. But you get the same kind of uh, trend. But around day four, it just drops off. So we don't have an answer for that. Um, this is a result that we just looked at this year. Um, ACMWF does better in the Westpac. Everybody says that's true. So uh, yes. uh, the main difference between the, the, the original and the 2012-13 was the hybrid data simulation? Uh, whatever else they put into the GFS, yeah. I mean, they're, they're constantly working on it, particularly the physics. Um, and there's other things that go into the data simulation. I would say that's the dramatic one. There's also increased resolution that's going in. You can't separate all that out. There was another question. Yeah, but, but there are you <coughs> the same storms? There's different storms then. What? Between 2008 and 2011. Yes, there are. But the idea is if you have enough seasons, then the, the season to season begins to average out. Granted, there's only two here. But the uh, if you look at the year to year, they look identical. So. These are exactly the kind of questions that I get every time I show that slide. <laughs> All right. The other thing we do is we run an experimental GFS. And Jeff Whitaker has been doing this for years. And this is actually, I think, in running this is where we convinced NCEP to really go to the hybrid system because he was getting spectacular results with his model. We continue that. And the main difference uh, last year uh, so we, first, we tried the Semi Lagrangian in real time, and they weren't doing that last year. At higher resolution, so twice the operational. And this was, we have a, an ensemble, we have a deterministic model, both at twice the operational resolution. Um, he was using something called stochastic physics, and some of you probably know what that means. And uh, <coughs> then they were doing some uh, Genesis products, and I'll show you that product. It's kind of neat. Um, <coughs> But high resolution, this new semi-Lagrangian, you know, um, shouldn't we do better? We actually did worse. Um, so this track, this is the uh, what we were running. Um, and this is what the operational model looked like. So it's worse. Uh, out here, it switches. But basically, we say the track errors were worse. The one thing that got better was the spread, <coughs> you know, the deviation from the, the mean track and the, act, and the track of a particular member um, is what these dotted lines are. And the um, operational model was, this is a GEFS, the operational model was under dispersive. Uh, what you'd like to see is, are these lines overlying, the solid and the dashed lines overlying each other. Um, so the, the spread got better. But the air got worse. And if you look at the wind, it's the same, it's the same uh, <coughs> um, problem. Here's another thing you see a lot is that the, the errors drop off with time. Um, a lot of people have a problem with that. But again, it's a different set of hurricanes that are long lived. This is what the deterministic model looked like, had the same message. So lessons learned. You can't just increase the resolution and expect things to get better. You have to do a lot of physics tuning, NDA tuning. Um, this is his uh, probabilistic product. This is for, what was the bee storm this year? Bertha, I think. You guys are worse than I am. Um, <clears throat> anyhow, this is the bee storm from this year. Um, this gives the probability of Tropical storm force winds out through 84 hours. 
uh, and it's cumulative. So, you know, black is 100%. So this was forecasting that this system would produce tropical storm force winds. This is an ensemble system, incidentally. 100% chance of the tropical storm force winds in that area. That's a nice product um, that he started using a couple years ago. And if you look at the verification for that, it's pretty good. Um, he verified over this whole area, including Westpac, Indian Ocean storms, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> this is what the operational model looked like. This is perfect, the dashed line. And you see the, um, uh, the GFS was doing pretty good with uh, forecasting the probability of storm force winds out, uh, in this case, to uh, uh, out to four days, three to four days. Genesis, uh, we're just going to show two products. These are ones that we kept insisting that people try, and they finally did. This is Tim Marchuk's work. This is just using, he applies this to all the operational models, so ECMWF, the NSET model, uh, I believe the Navy model. <clears throat> and these are the kind of products he puts out. This is just the forecast probability from 0 to 48 hours, and then this shows the tracks from of the system that would form in here uh, from the various ensemble members. And <clears throat> in watching this product, it works pretty well. If these are below about 50%, you can forget it, particularly if the tracks are kind of chaotic, like here and here. This might suggest something moving um, <coughs> eastward or west, eastward, westward um, in the southern part of the domain. I forget what this storm was. It actually did form. And um, <coughs> uh, if you look at the corresponding product that Jeff Whitaker put out, uh, this is from the same time. This is out for through seven days. Probability of storm force winds. So you can see that storm looked like it really would form. Um, this one down here didn't. So if you combine the two, you can get a pretty good idea, I think, of some of the Genesis probabilities. Um, okay, uh, HWARF and GFDL. I'm going to show one slide from GFDL, so the focus is in HWARF. <coughs> and this was sort of the goal. It's going to be the best tropical cyclone model. Uh, and we're hoping that it will be the choice internationally. The, most of the international choices are closer in Asia. Uh, Europe doesn't care much about hurricanes or typhoons. Um, so this is the history. Um, <clears throat> this was the model that they were using in 2011. And this is the error. We're showing it in error. This is intensity. And it was um, applied to these years, so 2008 to 2011. This is what we looked like in 2011. It was not a good model couldn't even come up to the uh, baseline that we had uh, established for intensity. Um, and we improved it in 2012. Still had enough to the baseline, but a dramatic improvement in skill. 2013, uh, again, retrospective runs over three years. Um, and that's a solid line here. Um, and then this is the uh, uh, system that we ran last year. Um, in 2013. Um, oh, and then the 14, the system that we're running this year, again, uh, computed over a three-year period. And you see at least beyond about 48 hours we're meeting or close to uh, the five-year baseline. That was the uh, <coughs> incentive for, for the earlier statement. Um, actually, in 2013, if you just looked at the real-time storms that we ran, you're approaching the 10-year goal. But again, as I said, that was an easy year. <coughs> One of the things that um, really jumped out, this, this is a slide from James Franklin, and whenever you get something from James, you trust. Um, <coughs> and he was quite impressed with that. This is the H. Wharf. Again, he, he plots only in skill. This is skill. Oh, I'm sorry, this is error. Um, <coughs> there are several. Or several other models on here, but particularly look at the um, these ships, the K ships, which is one of their statistical models that you, you have to beat or you'd like to beat. And LGEM is this green line, uh, GFDL. Um, <coughs> the, uh, 
in, in between 24 and about 72 hours, we were the H wharf model, at least on these retrospective runs, was beating the um, statistical model. It's the first time a dynamical model has ever been able to do that. And then these were some uh, runs from that year, um, <coughs> and you saw you see the same uh, pattern shows up. It's noisier because there are fewer cases, but. Um, <coughs> Well, all these different uh, things that they've been doing. One is the um, was the resolution, which I came in in 2013. But there's also changes in physics, changes in the initialization. Uh, another thing they did, I think, in this year is they increased the frequency at which physics was called. It used to be every half hour. And I think they do it every time step now. Have uh, you considered doing improvement denial? By taking oh, they do that. Um, every year, every year the H wharf people run about twenty thousand cases, um, and those cases include models that have the increased resolution or the different um, uh, physics scheme or whatever, and you you see how each one of those has affected the the so skill. Yeah, I just don't have them here, Rick. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to put you in a corner. It seemed like an obvious thing to do. Um, I mean, you can say, I mean, there's a lot of things going on at once in here. It's true. But they are getting better. Um, this is the official NHC uh, error. Um, and they put this out every year. You can go look it up on their website. And uh, these slopes will remain constant for track. Keep going down. Um, the five-day forecast is now uh, as good as the three-day forecast was back in 2000, for example. Um, but we noticed this. And HFIP started in 2009. Um, actually showed that to Louis one day, and then NHC got really upset. Oh, it's because you had all those easy years in there. Um, that's true. The other thing is, you know, the real skill is coming, intensity anyhow, is coming from H4. And those improvements didn't come in until 2012. So a lot of this is something else. But it's a fun slide to look at and speculate on. Uh, you know, one of the things we point out is with the models, you can go back and rerun a whole year. You can't go back and rerun the forecasters on the new data. So um, we're running it in the Westpac, and uh, the JTWC has been quite impressed with it. Um, some of their, their their better guidance products are coming from HWARF now. We run this on our machine here in Boulder. It's running right now. This is uh, 2013. It's competing with things like TC Coamps, uh, the GFDL model and the, that the Navy runs, much better. <clears throat> and then in intensity, you get the same thing. Here's H4. The official forecasts are better, but that's good. They're adding skill. How are we doing on RI? Last year, we couldn't do much in the Atlantic because there were no cases of RI. <coughs> Rapid intensification. Um, but there were a lot in the Pacific, as you recall, or may recall. There were certainly a lot of intense storms. And um, this is really the first time anybody ever bothered to try to do a statistic on uh, the probability of detection of rapid intensification. And what we got for H wharf was about a 23%. Now, it's far cry from 60 or 90. <coughs> but it is beginning to show some skill. This is what the uh, official forecast looked like, 4%. And the GFDN was giving about 10%. The um, false alarm rates are basically zero. They're down in here. But this is the, 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 the box that includes the rapid intensifiers. Is each dot a case? It's a case. Is it uh, more than one? Some dots have, some dots have two dots of, over top of each other. So you can't necessarily count them. I know Ed Mifflin and I try to 
improve this thing by counting the dots, and it was not possible. Now, this is the only one I'm going to show on, on the GFDL model. Uh, it's still being run operationally. Uh, they made some changes this year in the physics. One of the main things they did was change the flux parameters for heat and momentum, um, which, you know, in a direction a lot of people thought was unreasonable. But the model got much better. Um, the operational model that they were running at that time is this black line, and this is what the, the new upgrades was giving them. This is an intensity, again, in aerospace. So the um, they see a dramatic improvement. Um, and then you compare that to some of the other models, LGEM, K ships. You notice LGEM is this blue line, and they're beating the statistical model. Um, one of the things we started last year was an ensemble of the H wharf, um, and this has been quite impressive. This was a very simple model. It takes the uh, perturbations from uh, GFS to start the, the boundary conditions and the initial conditions. But then what it does every time step, it has this um, random uh, perturbation on the, on the, on the uh, physics or the convection trigger um, is what it looks like. Um, this year they're doing something more. I'm not sure. I, I don't remember the exact change. This is still in there, the convective trigger. But and this time that was the only trigger they were using. This is what the results look like. Um, uh, this is the operational model, and then, then this is the, uh, the mean, uh, the ensemble mean um, <clears throat> from the, un well, the ensemble mean from the ensemble. Um, this is track, and yeah, the, um, it, the track's got better. Uh, out here, the number of cases is way too small, but you know, in here, um, the tracks to get a little bit better, but the improvement intensity was impressive, almost 50%. Um, again, forget about these out here. So the h -Warf Ensemble run, it was run in stream 1.5. We have th three streams that we're, we consider in terms of development. There's the operational model and its development. We call that stream 1. That's an effort that we fund at some level. Uh, there's a stream 2, which basically represents all the, all the uh, research models that we're, we're funding or are running. And then there's Stream 1.5, which is a collection of models selected by NHC that they will actually look at during the hurricane season as they make the forecast. And this was one of them. <coughs> and this year we're starting to run a joint ensemble with, uh, with the Navy. We ran this. Go ahead. But, but does the operation and the ensemble have the same physics and same resolution? Yep. It was exactly the same model. The only thing different are the perturbations. And they ran 20 members. These are the means, yeah. Here's, here's an example. This was Raymond. This was a <coughs> notoriously badly forecast hurricane in the East Pack. And um, it did it develop. It was up here. Um, most of the members didn't, but a few of them did. Now, whatever that means, I'm not sure. But we ran it in, in other basins. Um, in fact, the H Wharf itself is run in all basins. Uh, these basins, Atlantic, East Pac, uh, Indian Ocean. We also run it in Central Pacific and West Pac. And then this is what the uh, um <coughs> ensemble means compared to the uh, deterministic model looked like in those various basins. Very basically the same message, message we got in the Atlantic. Say something about the Stream 1.5 models. I mentioned briefly what a Stream 1.5 model was. What happens is a bunch of models. Um, say they want to run, uh, in retrospect, um, a bunch of tests, a bunch of storms that the NHC has picked out. They'll run them in the spring. <coughs> All that data is collected here at the TCMT, um, <coughs> who then analyze the data, look at the comparison. They send it all back to NHC, who then looks at the results and then makes decisions. Are these models they want to look at this year or not? It's very pretty much the same way it's done for the operational model, uh, not quite as extensively, but um, gives them a pretty good idea of what the model performance will look like. And then they choose, and this is what they chose. And there's a number of options. Um, 
One is just look at it from the forecast perspective of track, and these are the models that they chose. So the H4 for the GFDL and the FIM. FIM did very well that year. Uh, track consensus. Um, they have a uh, consensus model that includes various um, uh, models that they look at uh, every every day. Uh, put together as a consensus, so ECMW, FGFS, and so forth. And at that time, they decided that they'd use the Penn State model and in the track consensus. And then intensity, just looking at the raw intensity, and then again in the consensus over here. So that's what they chose to look at. And here's some results. Um, this is uh, Clipper in skill space. Or not Clipper, this is track in skill space. Um, Official forecast is the black, uh, the uh, Canadian model. Is this yellow? No, no, I'm sorry, that's the Canadian model way down there. That's their consensus model with uh, the FIM in it. Um, this dashed line here is Florida State Super Ensemble. Um, H Wharf is this line in here. That's track. Um, and you notice that the um, NCAR or W wasn't selected. That was one of the ones that they had considered. This was Ryan Torn, um, and they did not select that for whatever reason. And then the intensity looks like this. Now, I keep saying that you have one of the biggest problems in uh, in intensity forecasting is to do better than a statistical model, and even the simplest statistical model. Um, is hard to beat. Well, it wasn't true last year. It beat it in spades. Um, this is skill again, and you notice that the that the improvements are up around 80 percent. You never see that. Strange year, but regardless, you can still look at this. Uh, this purple line is the H wharf. Okay, good is up. Uh, Florida State model yellow is uh, um, the consensus model and then the official down here. But the h warp did very well last year in intensity. This is just last year. Um, so I'm getting towards the end here. Um, this is what we th I think we should be doing for the next five years. Um, what's going on in day beyond days four and five? Why is that uh, growth rate and in intensity there? Um, we get jumped on. Uh, from NHC, when we say this, they say they don't care about the seven-day forecast. We're more interested in the one- to three-day forecast. We got jumped on by the uh, Scientific Review Committee, who also felt that the one- to three-day forecast was more important. But we have the seven-day forecast goal. So, you know, if you don't do something about that um, five- to seven-day forecast, um, then forget about the seven-day. And uh, Bill and Chris Davis, I think, were providing some money for to look at that. And I know he's given seminars on EMC. I don't know if you guys have talked about it here yet or not, but I think it's an interesting problem. Um, use regional models, again, at one to three kilometer resolution. I think we're really going to have to aim to go to one, maybe even half a kilometer to do the eyeball right. Saw some work by um, Dave Nolan that... Um, Showed if you don't if you don't go to those kind of resolutions, you really start missing certain physics. Uh, again, hybrid DA, regional models, statistical post-processing. I haven't talked a lot about it, but the Florida State model is an example. The um, LGEM now is being used uh, uses predictors from the models themselves, which is a form of statistical post-processing. And there's another one we're starting to look at called Gypsy which is a model that Jim Gers has put together that looks better than the Florida State model. Gypsy, I think G stands for Gers, and you can figure out the rest of it. Um, and eventually, HWARF will evolve into a global model with multiple moving nests. That's, that's the idea. So if you go out to 10 years, what, a, what where do we want to go to in 10 years? So merge the regional model and global model. And the idea is to start by developing a large outer domain within, but still have it nested within a global model. I'll show you that in a minute. 
<coughs> where the global model only provides boundary conditions, so it's not a two-way interaction or not an interaction. And then multiple internets for each storm and generally two domains uh, per storm nested in each other. And then eventually expand the outer domain to global. Change your domain card, I guess. Um, and at that point, then the internets will be interacting fully with the global model. Run as an ensemble, I'm not quite sure what that means yet, but some level of ensemble of information. This is sort of a stopgap. The idea here is since we're in the NMM model framework, we're going to move to NMMB. Uh, it's going to be run in the, the NEMS framework. Um, once you have all that together, it's easy to make a global model. However, some of you are aware, I know Joe is, that um, NCEP is now reconsidering what their global model is going to be. Um, there's a competition, I guess, to decide what core that would be. Um, and whatever's adopted, we'll have to adopt that as well. Uh, but at least as a stopgap, that's our thinking. About the internet, they're moving nests. Yeah, here I'll show you. That's, a, that's an actual forecast that we did. Uh, so this is the, uh, the current basin scale domain, they call it. And these are three hurricanes going at once, and you can see them moving along. Um, didn't do so well on this track. <coughs> and then what would the future system look like? Uh, again, a global model, moving internets, 18 kilometer resolution for the global model, probably better. Um, so if you have 18, um, I guess you go to six and two kilometer resolution in the, in the two inner domains, uh, self-consistent data simulation system between them. Don't remember as ensembles. Uh, idea is to use two or more, and that was the idea of getting the Navy involved, because they, they would run their own system, and so basically that's free for now. Using all available aircraft data, <coughs> statistical parts processing, and then various guidance products. So um, I'm reluctant to show this slide. I, we had a competition last year for um, university proposals, and uh, we finally finished that. Um, I think all the grants are out. Um, when we originally uh, started planning or putting the, the awards together, we, we planned on 10. And those are the 10 that we were going to fund. And we did fund all of those. Um, Fred found some more money, Fred Tepfer, um, and so we extended it three more. And I don't have those, and I just couldn't get it in time for this. This is about a 47, 13 is about a 47% acceptance rate. Uh, we had 29 proposals and we funded 13. So that's all I had. All right, we have time for questions. It seems that so far, um, the focus for HFIP has been pretty much fixed on track and intensity. And I was wondering whether, um, you know, will be started booming into more like the structure of the hurricanes, how well the model handle that, and... Um, you know how many times you've been asked that question? Um, more than once. <laughs> um, <coughs> the answer, the, the goals that we set out are goals that make sense to NHC. That's what they're forecasting. So it's intensity and track and then these other things, RI. Um, <coughs> and everybody argues that there should be some other measures that we should be looking at. Structure. And so some of the structure measures that people look at are the radii of various wind thresholds, um, uh, eye diameter, things like that. Those are simple ones you can do. Uh, you can drive cross-sections, of course, and look at those, do comparisons. We do all that. All that's done. Um, <coughs> I didn't show any of those plots, but, you know, uh, we had the same argument with the SRC about three weeks ago. Um, they should be, we should be looking at these other parameters. I said, but we are. But these are the ones that, you know, and if you, if you say that to NHC, they get upset. They say, look, what we really care about is intensity and track. 
And that's what we forecast. And so you've got to retain those. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> NOAA is embarking on some new projects that really look at airborne sensing, uh, essentially replacements of the P3s and, and the sensing platforms associated with it. Do you have any sense of, of how much the reconnaissance data contributes to forecast improvements of, of intensity and track? And if you had a wish list of other things you could sense, both atmospheric and maybe ocean, you know, what would they be? Yeah, that's a multi-pronged question. In the first place, the P3s aren't going to be replaced. Uh, the, the next issue with the P3s are, are, is the rewinging, and as a result of Sandy, they got new wings. So that goes for another 30 years. 15. Huh? I think it's 15 more years. Uh, 30. Anyhow, most of you won't be working by the time they're done. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Okay, so that's the P3s. Um, what other platforms? Um, I think there's interest in looking at um, independently flown vehicles inside the storm. Um, I'm not sure what they would look like. One of the things that they've been experimenting with in HRD is a system they drop out through the drops on chute. And it's basically a drops on with wings and a little propeller on the front. And it, and it goes down into the boundary layer. Um, Global Hawk, of course, um, that's being used. Um, there's an awful lot of satellite data we're not using, in part because we don't know how to use it because of the clouds and the rain. Um, and one of the things we've been trying to emphasize is to have people look at how you might use some of the data. Um, there's a group at UCLA that's looking at microwave data and looking very promising. Well, it's a really hard one, hard problem to do. Um, I personally don't think data is the problem right now. I think the problems are more using what we have. Um, and that's a big problem. If you, if you look at our, if you look at the HWARF improvements, um, they're all occurring at the longer time. Initially, there's not much improvement. And if you watch the storms from the very beginning, there's usually a dramatic readjustment, right? right when we take off, either stronger or weaker. And um, uh, not quite sure what's, all do, what, what's doing that and how to fix it, but um, that's all part of the problem. Initialization is part of the problem, using the data. Do I think the aircraft data will have an impact? I mentioned earlier, yes. I mean, I could show you the plots that PCMW, PC, these guys produced. <laughs> um, and it's, it's mixed, but there is a message in there that the, if you use all the aircraft data, you get a better intensity forecast. Maybe not so much track, but intensity forecast. Track, we're probably getting improvements using the Gulf Stream. Sorry. Joe, you had a question. Um, yeah, in your slide of the future plans, you mentioned the intent to drive a, an outer domain for H4 just from the boundaries from the global model. That's a, an important uh, distinction, as you mentioned, between you know, requiring uh, a, a two-way interaction. And it seems a bit different from what we've been hearing from the H4 folks in terms of requirements for this next generation global system that NSEP is, uh, uh, is, is working toward. Because they've been stressing that they need to have uh, moving nests within this global modeling uh, system. Uh, but if, if you're only going to be driving it from the boundary, then the global model does not have to be, that these, these don't, don't have to be part of the same modeling system. You can have a different model getting its boundary conditions from the new next generation global model. You could, but the idea is to have two-way interaction between, or interaction one-way interaction is an oxymoron, so I try to... <laughs> but the, you know, if... They're emphasized just providing the lateral boundaries, just the, the one-way interaction in the, in, to in, the outer domain. In the, in the basin scale. Right. But once you expand it to global, then, it, then in, if it's interacting at the basin scale, then once you expand it to global, then it's interacting at the global scale. How important that is, I don't know. Um, uh, some people think it's very important, particularly when the hurricanes are relatively close to each other. 
Um, perhaps it's a problem, part of this uh, four-day problem, or why that still drops off, or because you're not changing the large-scale flow enough from the hurricane. Um, we, gen we generally think. You mean the basin scale that the high resolution moving nests are moving within? Yeah, the, 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 this thing, yeah. These are all the interactions. This interacts with that two ways. This interacts with that two ways. Right, but These, what happens out there? This is just fixed. Yeah. Now, the idea, okay, as long as we stay with this, um, <coughs> then you're right. It doesn't matter. If if this down be, if this domain now becomes the globe, and that was the idea. Um, the experiments with the basin scale, I didn't show any results from that. They're not really a whole lot different than just running each one of these things separately. <coughs> well, Bob, of course, this uh, the design is is actually my opinion here is really coming from the meso scale up, right? Mm -hmm. You could also actually have another another design by actually going from global down. And for example, uh, recent work done by Chris Davis has been showing that um, the performance of uh, GFS, the global model uh, system, particularly over the Western Pacific, is very strongly motivated by the model's ability to handle MJLs. For example, so I mean, you could also view that we could have a global model, and we have a tropical channel model at much higher resolution. You handle entire tropics globally, and then this that way you don't have to worry about, <laughs> uh, you know. Yeah, I know. I mean, I talk to Sandy McDonald; he's going to run me a global model at three kilometers. Fine. Yeah. I mean, but I just said that maybe we maybe three isn't where we need to stop. Maybe it has to be much higher resolution, like half a kilometer. Can you run a global? channel at half a kilometer. I, I don't know. It depends on computers. You know, eventually all this regional stuff probably, oh, it'll never go away because as soon as you get to half a kilometer in your global model, you're going to want to go 10 meters, right? <laughs> yes, uh, I have a question. So I heard that it's uh, H. Warfers uh, was coupled with this uh, ocean model. Uh -huh. And does that is uh, helpful? Uh, is that helpful to say, improve this hurricane forecast, especially uh, in the intensity? I mean, the HWARF is coupled to an ocean, an active ocean. Um, I'm not sure on these basin scales. I don't think the basin scales are coupled to an active ocean. I think it's just probably constant sea surface temperature, some mixing thing. But um, there's a, there is a strong debate in the community on how important the ocean is and how simple you can make the ocean um, uh, in terms of if, you know, having the ocean impact on the hurricane. Uh, I can guarantee you there are some people who will fall on their sword to say that um, you've got to have a three-dimensional model under this thing and you ain't going to get it. Uh, and I think that's especially true in places like the Gulf where you have a lot of three-dimensional structure and the hurricane interacts with the uh, the flow underneath in complex ways. When you're out here, it probably doesn't matter much because the ocean doesn't change. The simple, maybe 1D mixing, or uh, might work well out there. Um, the uh, I think this year, I've got to be careful. I think this year the uh, the East Pack now has a coupled model ocean under it. They didn't. They didn't used to, um, and the West Pack still doesn't have an active ocean under. It. All right, other questions? <coughs> All right, well, thank you, Bob. Sure.